the universe is over 13 billion years old. It's filled with 50,000 billion billion stars. That's more than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world. But the universe of numbers is even vaster, beyond our ability to count, but not beyond our ability to imagine. In this program, I'll take you from one end of that universe to the other, from zero to infinity. For most of us, our first encounter with mathematics is through the simple act of counting. This is how mathematics began, with what mathematicians now call a set of natural numbers. The ability to count gave some animals an evolutionary advantage. Being able to tell whether you're outnumbered or not could help you to decide whether to fight or fly. Those who can count survive. As civilizations developed, these numbers became words that people could use to count things, like how many cattle they had, or how many things they were swapping for other things. Humans first thought of numbers in far more concrete terms than today's abstract concept. Already 22,000 years ago, early man was representing numbers by carving notches into bones. It took several thousand years to go from seven goats to seven things to the abstract idea of seven. As soon as children can learn how to count, one of the next things they want to find out is to see how far they can get. And they soon learn that numbers can get very, very big. Chess is a game that particularly appeals to mathematicians. To play it well, you need to logically piece together what will happen several moves ahead. The end game is like a mathematical proof where the logic of the game forces one of the players to lose their king. Checkmate. Legend has it that chess was invented in India by a mathematician. The king was so pleased with the game that he offered the mathematician any prize as a reward. The mathematician thought for a while and then named his prize. He asked that one grain of rice be placed on the first square of the chessboard, that two grains of rice be placed on the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and so on such that each square got double the number of grains of rice of the previous square. The king thought he'd got away lightly, but he didn't realise how quickly numbers can grow. By the time I'm on the tenth square, there are more than a thousand grains of rice. In ten more squares, there will be more than a million. By the time you reach the last square on the board, the 64th, there are meant to be over 18 billion billion grains of rice. That's more rice than can be grown on the surface of the planet in one year. We call this way numbers increase exponential growth. And it's a way that numbers can become very, very big, very, very quickly. And it was the Indians, the inventors of chess, that also came up with a way to make these numbers manageable. There's nothing here. Nada, zilch, zero. But is zero a number? We count from the number one not zero. Zero hasn't been around for as long as the other numbers. It needed to be invented. I met Dr Eleanor Robson, an expert on the history of zero. So in fact there are two different uses of zero. There's zero to represent nothing at all, which we might think of as the most obvious mm, thing for zero. Yes. But in fact the earliest historically was zero to represent nothing in the middle of a number. So for instance when we write 1206 there are no tens so we write zero in the tens place. Mm -hmm. The Romans didn't need to do that because they just didn't write any x's. But if you're using uh, the same numerals in different places in a place value system then it's important. Mm -hmm. So the Babylonians who used a base 60 place value system and they also did very complicated astronomical calculations needed 
to keep control of that, to stop their places getting out of order in calculations. Right. And I guess astronomical, like numbers get uh, We get literally big. astronomical, astronomical large, yeah, so, enough. Yeah. Nice. So let me show you this. This is a reference table that Babylonian astronomers used in about 300 BC. Wow. And here, can you see these vertical marks are tens, and then this little thing here is the, mm. a zero in the middle, and then it goes nine, zero. They were using the zero here as a place system mm. more. Um, yeah. So who was really the first culture to come up with um, zeros meaning nothing? I mean, as well, an actual number. That was another culture that used place value system. That was uh, in India. Now, that's very difficult to date because we don't have uh, original sources like we do for the tablet. So it's somewhere about 1,000 to 1,500 years ago, we think, that they marked just a little dot to mean either zero in the middle of a number or to mean nothing at all. Right. Certainly by the 8th century, their, uh, right, their numeral system, which is essentially the same as our modern numerals, 1 to 9 and 0, had reached the Middle East. And it became massively popular particularly after Al-Khwarizmi, who's very famous for his algebra, wrote a little book for, for the Caliph of Baghdad explaining how these new numbers worked and how you could not only write with them, but calculate with them too. Right, and we and call them the Arabic numerals, or that mm. they are actually originated in India. So That's it's, it's, right. So we, we call them the Arabic numerals because of... Uh, um, because of Al-Khwarizmi, who uh, popularised them. And it happily coincided with the invention of, of mass production of paper. So with counters, you just need whatever's in your pocket and a flat surface. Right. But if you're calculating with numerals, you need some medium, you need something to write it on. And the mass production of paper really began in Baghdad and around there in the late 9th century, taking old clothes and other fabrics, ru rubbish basically, and turning it into very cheap disposable paper so that you could then... Um, do your rough calculations and throw the paper away and it didn't matter. So that's amazing, the, the invention of paper actually helped zero take off as a concept. Absolutely, yes. Oh. Thank you very much, Eleanor. It's a pleasure. It was an Indian mathematician called Brahmagupta who first developed the mathematics of zero in the 7th century. He wrote that if you add or subtract zero from any number, you get the number. But if you multiply by zero, you get zero. However, he had a little bit more trouble when it came to dividing by zero. He thought that the answer should be zero. But mathematicians soon realised there was something wrong with that. And here's why. If I take 6 and I divide it by 2, well, that's equal to 3. That's because 3 times 2 gives me 6. But look what happens if I take 6 and divide it by zero. If that's equal to some number x, I'm in trouble, because x times 0 gives me 0, not 6. So dividing by 0 is mathematically meaningless. But we could do something else. We could divide by ever smaller, smaller numbers. For example, 1 divided by a tenth gives me 10. 1 divided by a hundredth gives me 100. 1 divided by a thousand gives me a thousand. So if I divide by smaller and smaller numbers, perhaps the answer spirals off to infinity. In mathematics, there are sometimes just too many of something to count. In this case, we say there are infinitely many of them. But just how big is infinity? Is it even a number? This is a question the great German mathematicians Cantor and Hilbert spent a lot of time thinking about. Cantor and Hilbert showed that infinity, like zero, doesn't behave quite like other numbers. Welcome to Hilbert's Hotel, a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, filled with an infinite number of guests. The great thing about Hilbert's Hotel is that even though it's full, we can always fit in another guest. If a new guest arrives, all the original guests just move one room along, leaving room number one free for the new guest. Because there are infinitely many rooms, none of the original guests is left without a room. So, infinity plus one is infinity. We can even fit an infinite number of new guests into the hotel. We simply ask all the guests to move into the room that is twice the number of the room they're in. So, the people in room one move into room two. The people in room two move into room four. The people in room three move into room six, and so on. This fills up all the even-numbered rooms. As there are an infinite number of even numbers, 
the infinite number of guests in the hotel all get rooms. Now all the odd number rooms are free. Since there are infinitely many odd numbers, we can accommodate infinitely many new guests into Hilbert's hotel. So infinity plus infinity is still infinity. But what if infinitely many coaches arrive at Hilbert's hotel, each containing infinitely many guests? Can you accommodate them in Hilbert's hotel? Here's a hint. There are infinitely many rooms on each floor and infinitely many floors in Hilbert's hotel. So infinity times infinity is still infinity. Strange. So infinity doesn't quite behave like other numbers, but you can still do some interesting maths with it. Most of us accept that the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on are infinite. You might think that the set of fractions is much bigger than the set of natural numbers because there are infinitely many fractions between 1 and 2, right? Wrong. Let me show you why. Each tile here represents a fraction. So in this first column here, I've got all the fractions with denominator 1. In the second column, I've got all the fractions with denominator 2. In the third column, all the fractions with denominator 3, and so on. The rows and columns stretch off to infinity, so that I've got a grid with all the fractions in. Now, in this bag, I've got the set of natural numbers. So how can I pair up all of the natural numbers with these fractions to prove that the set of fractions is actually the same size as the set of whole numbers? Well, I could start by running along this top row. But because the row goes on for infinity, I'm going to be walking forever and I'll never reach any of the other rows. But there's a cleverer way I can do this pairing. If I start in this corner here and start to make a pattern, looking a little bit like a snake, then I'm going to cover every fraction with a whole number. I've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I can keep on going, and in this way I'll pair up all the fractions with the whole numbers. Because I can do this, we call the set of fractions countably infinite. Although I'm still going to have to walk forever to cover the whole grid, you can see that no fraction is left uncovered by a whole number if I walk in this snake-like pattern. Well, I hope I've convinced you that the set of fractions is actually the same size as the set of whole numbers. But not all infinities have the same size. I'll leave you as a challenge to prove that you can't pair up all the decimals with the set of natural numbers. If you can do that, you'll have proved that there are uncountably many numbers between 0 and 1. Zero and the different sorts of infinity are numbers that have been invented or created by mathematicians. There are lots of other numbers as well, things like irrational numbers, like the square root of 2, or transcendental numbers like e and pi, even imaginary numbers built out of the square root of minus 1. The universe of numbers is as richly populated as the night sky, filled with things as mysterious as black holes and as wondrous as the stars. Thank you.